Well, that was Shamim Chowdhury there from inside a Turkish detention center near the city of Izmir. Now to discuss Sofia and Mustafa Kemal's case and the predicament of other former fighters, let's go to our panel. Nadim Houri joins us from Paris. He's the executive director of the Arab Reform Initiative. In London is Maria Mahmoud. She's a research associate at Oxford University. And Tessa Glinoa is with the conservative think tank, the Henry Jackson Society. Good to have you all on the program. Nadim, we look at this guy, Sofyan, who's Abu Hamza's son. He says, yes, I was a fighter. Yes, I might have killed people, but I was a moderate rebel. I wasn't Daesh. Now they've taken my passport away and I want to go home. And the British government and others, other Western countries are saying, this is none of our business. We don't want to deal with these people anymore. Is this just one case like so many others where governments just don't really want to deal with the headache, so they're just stripping people of their passports? Yes, unfortunately, and this is an increasing recent trend in Western countries, withdrawing citizenship uh, in many cases before even convicting someone in a criminal trial. Now, this raises a number of uh, international law issues, particularly human rights issues, because you cannot render someone stateless, and you cannot take away someone's citizenship without due process, the right for them to, uh, you know, to question these decisions. But it also raises all sorts of policy issues. If all countries start withdrawing citizenship of those who are unwanted, where will they be? Is that the best collective security solution? Or are they going to create a group of stateless people, you know, roaming somewhere between the Middle East and Europe? And I think this is also a big criticism of this policy because it doesn't resolve anything. It just transposes the issue mm -hmm. at a time, and it's transposing it to the weakest partners. You know, it could be uh, people holding them in detention in the Middle East, in Northeast Syria, in Iraq, uh, people who have a lot less resources than Western countries, and frankly, people who inherited this problem. They are not the ones who contribute to the radicalization of these individuals. Uh, so it really should be the British authorities who prosecute, uh, like the other European countries, prosecute their nationals mm -hmm who may have committed or joined ISIS or other uh, unwanted groups. Right. Tessa, is this a case of these governments just wanting to wish away the problem? No, I don't think it's a case of governments wanting to wish away the problem. I think regarding the issue of statelessness, um, the international community should pump more money into the local justice systems in Syria and perhaps even Iraq. And they should pump more money into organizations like the SE, C, uh, SCEC, which are trying to de-radicalize. They have de-radicalization program, uh, programs trying to de-radicalize former fighters and fighters that have shown an interest in wanting to heal. Um, it's very difficult, certainly from the UK's perspective, to, from a moral perspective, from a legal perspective, to take back former fighters, especially if they show no remorse or no guilt mm -hmm. over the killings, over the atrocities, the hundreds of thousands of people killed right. as a res direct result of ISIS Although, actions. Yeah, Tessa, why, why would you... We so, sorry to interrupt you. So, sorry to interrupt you, yes. Maintaining their position and I, there. I, yeah, I understand are. there's a slight delay. Sorry to yeah. interrupt you, right? Why would you want to give money to Bashar al-Assad's government to tell them, hey, we want to give you money to boost your legal system when fundamentally at the heart of this war, he is a key part of the problem? I'm not advocating that we give money to that government in particular. I'm advocating that we, for example, the global community is a collective that are trying to increase the quality of the justice systems over there in that part of the world. And I'm saying organizations such as the, IIM, such as the IIIM are also trying to create trials, create a system of law, a justice system that can potentially prosecute former fighters overseas. So we don't it doesn't necessitate having to bring them back here. And it does not at all support the government there. Okay. Only so, if those okay. justice systems were right. okay. so let's get, let's to get, be, let, let's get Maria were to be to look undertaken at this. in okay. Syria uh, that understood. we would have to support okay. the government. So let's, let me add to Syria. Let me add Iraq as an interesting and perhaps more accurate example here. So the Iraqis have had their own trials of Iraqi citizens and foreigners. Mm. And for the Iraqis, Maryam, when we look at it, it's not only victor's justice, but it's also former victim's justice because the Iraqis bore the brunt of Daesh's atrocities. Human rights groups criticize the Iraqis for unfair trials in Iraq. They say that people are being sentenced to death, life imprisonment, and so on for mere association with Daesh or ISIS. So, 
With that in mind, do you have any trust that the legal systems in that part of the world, as was mentioned by Tessa, can actually bring about justice so that these people don't have to be repatriated to Western countries? That's a very interesting question, and I'd just like to follow up on the points made by my fellow panelists with regards to this. Um, uh, I think one thing, it strikes me as quite amusing, is that we have Western governments who are very happy to intervene in these situations, boots on ground. But when it comes to the aftermath, nobody wants to pitch in and clean up a mess that is actually something that developed in our own home turf. So with regard to the case of Shamima Begum, may I remind you at this point, though, 400 out of the 900 people who went to fight for ISIS from Britain have returned. Now, the issue of citizenship being removed only came into uh, question or was um, brought up in this me media spectacle following Shamima Begum's case. Now, Home Secretary at the time was Shadid Javed, and he claimed that, you know, we wouldn't be doing anything illegal if we were to remove her citizenship, which we ended up doing, because she could avail of Bengali citizenship through her parents. Now, this was immediately thwarted by Bengali government officials, considering right. the fact that, you know, this is quite a, a dubious thing, because, you know, Today we have terrorism as the reason for revocation or removal of citizenship. Tomorrow, what could it be? Okay. It's very but, selectively okay, applied. But let's, let's Secondly, focus with on regard the, to the court, let, let's focus on the today, right? Just yes. for a second, because you say that tomorrow sure. there might be a slippery slope. The Indonesians, for example, yes. can verifiably prove that returnees from Daesh land, whether in Syria or in Iraq, mm -hmm. in the former Daesh Caliphate have conducted acts mm -hmm. of terror in Indonesia over the past mm -hmm. two years, starting in 2017. Mm -hmm. That's an mm -hmm. example of the fears that these governments have. These people come back and they're going to do terrible stuff R in our lands. Address right. that for me. Yeah, r rightfully, they are afraid, obviously, you know. But the point is, I must stress that these individuals who've gone from their respective countries, in the case of Britain, should see the due process of law and justice in this country. They left from here. Um, obviously, w what's very, very um, strange and striking is the fact that only one in ten individuals who have returned have been prosecuted. What we should be doing instead of having this conversation is talking about right and retribution and justice and also rehabilitation of individuals. They are a British problem, as the Bengali authorities have said. They should be tried under British rule because, you know, these individuals, they can try and make their way back into the country, um, right. whether it's okay. legal or illegal. Okay, the so point is, we need to ensure right. that this doesn't happen again, and unfortunately, okay. it continues to happen. I want to ask Tessa, do you believe that it's the responsibility of the countries from which these people traveled or emerged or are citizens of to rehabilitate them and absorb them, reabsorb them into society? I just want to say, first of all, that Amassing evidence from a foreign conflict zone is very difficult. And I also want to add that in UK courts, uh, the evidentiary requirements are, the standard is incredibly high. And so, you know, as it stands, only 10% of the former fighters that have come back who've been on trial have been prosecuted. And where do the other 90% go? They're free to walk, potentially free to walk our streets, um, irrespective even of the, T, uh, the TPIM measures. Um, on the basis of rehabilitation as well, there is very mixed evidence citing, and there's very little evidence to compare recent findings against that prove that rehabilitation works, especially in the likelihood of recidivism, which means the likelihood of a, a convicted criminal to, to reoffend. Nadim it's, Hori. It's all very vague. Okay. And okay. We, you know, so let's ask Nadim. What, what let's comes ask, first? The Nadim, public welfare, is public there safety? little evidence, Nadim, that rehabilitation works, or does it vary from? country to country, conflict to conflict, fighter to fighter? Yeah, the, you know, the evidence uh, varies greatly. Um, and again, what is your definition of success? Different countries have different definitions of success. Uh, in some countries, de-radicalization means just getting rid of someone's uh, violence and inclination to violence, even if they maintain ideas that you know, most of us would find abhorrent. In other countries, they almost want to change someone's ideas, and there are a lot of issues around that. But I also think we need to distinguish between two things here. I don't think anyone is denying 
the need to prosecute these people. But what is essential is provide them with fair trials and let there be evidence. For the last few years, most countries have been adopting law after law to prosecute terrorism offenses. It would be unfair and doesn't make sense to say today, well, the UK doesn't have sufficient laws to prosecute these people. If they don't, uh, why haven't they changed them in the last few years? And we know that most countries have already changed. Uh, and if they're not bothering to collect the evidence, then let them invest more in collecting the evidence. Right. You can't say, well, we're not sure what you've done, but we think you're bad enough, so we just don't want you to back. Then I think there's a second issue, which is very important, which is the withdrawal of, of citizenship uh, in this case uh, that we're discussing. Because that is, for me, a way of relinquishing responsibility. It's almost assuming, I mean, there are really two, two arguments here, saying, well, you know, it's not Britain's problem. It's whoever that second country's problem is going to be. And why should that be? Why should it be Bangladesh's problem in Shamima Begum's case? You know, the, a woman who's never mm -hmm. actually set foot in, in Bangladesh. You know, you, you can already see the sort of form of, you know, the West saying, well, I'd rather protect my society. I don't care what happens to Bangladesh, and Bangladesh has to take them back. Or if we go full and say, well, this person will be rendered stateless. They're going to be stuck forever in Syria or Iraq or maybe Turkey, uh, you know, whichever other country. Right. Then it's going to be your country, your responsibility to deal with that. And again, why should that be? I mean, the only assumption is a sort of very cynical position by the UK and other countries that they're saying, well, maybe let Iraq prosecute everyone. Let, it, let, it, let Iraq sentence them to death. We'll turn our eyes away mm -hmm. and maybe the problem will be resolved. But we know that doesn't actually resolve problem. And frankly, that doesn't give justice to victims either. So yes for prosecutions, no for dereliction of responsibility, yes for more investment and resources. And let's see, I mean, there have been a lot of people who've returned from Syria and Iraq, and many have been de-radicalized. But it's mostly politicians are afraid, and I can completely understand, politicians have a right. responsibility to protect their society. But you cannot protect your society by, quote unquote, dumping the problem mm -hmm. on another country. Can I? Okay, okay. Uh, just very finely, I just want to mention that Germany has ordered, a German court has ordered the German government to repatriate the German wife and three children of a Daesh fighter, right? So we have the court stepping in saying we need to make that distinction between the man with the weapon who might have done unspeakable things on behalf of Daesh and the women and children of his family. Might this, very finally, Miriam, because we're completely out of time, I'm, I'm over time now. Miriam, sure. is, that a, sure. is that a sort of model that you think needs to be followed by other countries where the courts can more forensically jump into the personal circumstances and make that distinction? I think that courts should see things as a, on a case-by-case -case basis. So the reasons why people have gone, the, the motivations for returning, and also I think what we should be discussing more so than this issue of um, what, what to do now when everything is said and done is actually pumping more um, sort of resources and uh, money into nipping this problem of radicalization and this ideology in the bud. We need to fund um, sort of grassroots organizations who deal with this. We need to treat de-radicalization, uh, sorry, radicalization as a problem akin to drug taking or any other social ills, gang violence. We need to ensure that our next generation is not under this burden or right. under this uh, sort of pull or peer pressure of what essentially it is. Online grooming of rad and on okay. the basis of radicalization needs to be right. tackled. Right. Yeah. And, and that's a conversation beyond the remit of, of this one because that's a deeper question about mm. how do you de-radicalize people or how do you stop extremism. That's it's the for, question we should be having. That's for, yeah, that's for many further panels down the road. I'm out of time, but it's Good to have you all on the program. Nadim Hori, Maria Mahmoud, and Tessa Glenoa. Good to talk to you all.